This episode of Onward to Victory is proudly presented our friends at WCScreens.com, the banner sponsor for the entire 2023 season. If you have needs with screen printing, embroidery, or more, please check out our pals at West Coast Screen Printing and Embroidery at WCScreens.com. They have nationwide shipping and wholesale pricing. Not only are they big supporters of this podcast, but, like you, they are also diehard fans of the Fighting Irish. So where are they at? WCScreens.com. And on with the show. For a second year in a row, Onward to Victory will use some time during the month of November to commemorate Native American Heritage Month. Did you know that between 1914 and 1932, the Notre Dame football team squared off against Native American schools six times on the gridiron? So why was this significant? Well, some of the most memorable figures in Notre Dame history intersected with these ball games, but... Perhaps what can get swept under the rug is the understanding of the power of sports to bring folks together across cultural differences. Grab a locker room stool and gather around, and buckle up those chin straps, Irish fans. This is Onward to Victory. The song is called Canute Rockney and it's by our pal Joseph Rackish and it means one thing and one thing only. Get your hand in the dirt, it's time for the show. Hello everyone and welcome to Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast. My name is Alex Painter, welcome again. It's offering number 89 in show history, 89 and happy November to you all and I hope everyone is gearing up for a peaceful and relaxing Thanksgiving holiday. For the second year in a row, the show is going to celebrate the profound impact that Native Americans have had not only on the University of Notre Dame, but for the sake of our show in particular, her football team. And I guess just to address the former, let's not forget that Stephen Baden, who was the first priest ordained in the United States, actually came to South Bend originally, the area that would become the University of Notre Dame, on invitation by Potawatomi Chief Leopold Pokagan. This was in 1830. Now, if you're of the northern Indiana sort like I am, the names Pokagan and Potawatomi, they ring some bells. But it was 12 years after Baden bought these 524 acres of land that none other than Father Edward Soren arrived on the scene in 1842, where he established the university. So the university is established on lands that were purchased from the Potawatomi tribe. So I guess that was kind of a not-for-nothing moment. I just thought that might be some helpful context. But uh, you may remember episode 72 from November of 2022. And that was the episode that highlighted three native Notre Dame athletes, including 1890s baseball player Louis Sokalexis of the Penobscot tribe, football player and captain of Coach Knut Rockne's final team, that'd be center Tommy Yar, of the Snohomish tribe, and current women's lacrosse player Winter Jock from the Mohawk tribe. So these three players were featured and kind of touched on last year around this time. So if you're interested in this type of content, I'd strongly suggest you go back and listen to episode number 72. But as far as winter is concerned, I am eagerly awaiting the spring lacrosse season to see if she gets some minutes on the field. I know that women's lacrosse team is awful deep this year. I've just done a little bit of digging, but I hope she knows she has some fans not only in the Onward to Victory studio right now, but also among some of our fans. But at any rate, that was an episode, again, this last one, episode 72, 
that I wasn't sure how it would be received or how many folks would ultimately tune in, but much to my pleasant surprise, it was quite enjoyed, and I had some really nice messages about it. So here we go. A show theme so nice, we're hitting it twice. Don't forget to listen to the last episode. It was called Fogabala. It was about Father William Corby and the Irish Brigade. That was episode 88. came out uh, late October. You can't miss it. It is pivotal. It is crucial to the ethos of Notre Dame and to the early history and, of course, to one of the most famous landmarks, I guess I'll say, on campus. That's, of course, Fair Catch Corby. But... As for today, I am going to attempt to do two things here. First is kind of easy, I guess, and that is to outline the matchups between Notre Dame and the Native American schools. But secondly, I am going to try to properly contextualize them. So feel free to let me know how I do afterwards. But To kind of address the first point, uh, some folks may be unaware that Native American colleges exist. One of the earliest established institutions that happens to also be perhaps the most noteworthy, that would be the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. It was founded in 1879. They had one very famous alum who I will share more about in a moment. Now, these Native American schools were considered kind of a progressive move at the time. The idea of educating Native American children and adolescents because, well, there were actually few opportunities for educational advancement for Native Americans at this time. But really, the explicit charge of places like Carlisle was to fully assimilate and completely immerse these Native children into mainstream European American culture. So, I mean, essentially white culture, we'll call it as it is. But, of course, this was, on the other side of the coin, kind of meant to obliterate Native culture. In fact, during this time, during in large swaths of the country, uh, celebrating and observing some Native traditions and Native culture was actually against the law. So this kind of leaves an unsavory feeling in the modern day for some of us, I imagine. But another facet that was damning for schools like Carlisle was the rampant spread of infectious diseases on campus. Hundreds, and likely thousands, of children were stricken with illness and ultimately perished. This was due to an exposure to what were commonly known as, at the time anyway, white men's diseases. Perhaps the most common was tuberculosis, or often called consumption. But in a book I recently read called Path Lit by Lightning, It was shared that the first semester of boarding school at places like Carlisle, because students came in from all over the country and it was a boarding school and it was often the most difficult. And accounts of students entering the infirmary and leaving under a sheet into the school cemetery were very and sadly common. But one thing that Carlisle and other native schools used to help students assimilate was, you guessed it, sports. Perhaps the best athlete of the first half of the 20th century was an alumni of Carlisle, and that was Jim Thorpe. Thorpe was an All-American football player at Carlisle under head coach Glenn Pop Warner, the namesake of the youth football program you might be familiar with. And Thorpe was a three-time All-American in 1908 and a consensus one in 1911 and 1912. He was an Olympic gold medalist in Stockholm, Sweden during the Olympic Games in 1912, and he was an early professional football player, perhaps most notably with the Canton Bulldogs. I'm not finished yet. He also played parts of six seasons in Major League Baseball between 1913 and 1919. And uh, another not-for-nothing moment here, in 1912... I just learned this when I read the biography not long ago. He also won the Intercollegiate Ballroom Dancing Championship as well. So if you're looking for a good Jim Thorpe read, that's actually the book I was referencing earlier, A Path Lit by Lightning, was written about Jim Thorpe. I just didn't want to throw out a spoiler too quickly. And since we're talking about Thorpe here, I'm going to share an anecdote that comes from Rockney of Ages, written by a friend of the show, Jeffrey Harrell. Now, this is from chapter 24, page 183 in Rockney of Ages, but it's about the time that Rockney recalls playing Jim Thorpe in a professional football game. And I'm just going to read it, 
couple paragraphs here uh, verbatim. But quote, in a review of my playing career, one day stands out above all the others. The day I was playing professional football and tried to stop Jim Thorpe. These are Rockney's words. My job was to tackle him, which I did two times successfully, but with much suffering. After the second time, Thorpe smiled genially at me. Be a good boy, he said. Let Jim run. Thorpe took the ball again. I went at him, and never before have I received such a shock. It was as if a locomotive had hit me, followed by a ten-ton truck rambling over my remains. I lay on the field of battle while he pounded out a 40-yard run for a touchdown. He came back, helped me to my feet, and then patted me gingerly on the back. Smiling broadly, he said, That's a good boy, Canute. You let Jim run. So that's from Rockney of Ages by, by uh, Jeffrey Harrell. Always worth a good mention. I know I've read that anecdote on the show before, but it's certainly worth repeating. The day that Canute Rockney, as a professional football player, met Jim Thorpe. And though Thorpe had moved on from Carlisle by 1914, he was still fresh in the institution's memory that year when they were put on Notre Dame's schedule. At the time, Notre Dame's head coach was Jess Harper, and the recently graduated Knut Rockney was Harper's assistant. So the game between Notre Dame and Carlisle was played on November 14, 1914, coincidentally, during what would later become Native American Heritage Month. But this was a special game because it wasn't played in Indiana nor Pennsylvania, but rather Comiskey Park in Chicago. For Harper's boys, the Notre Damers, it was a sweeping victory. A 48-6 win, which at the time very uh, esteemed writer Walter Eckersall from the Chicago Tribune wrote, quote, It was a bruised and battered team of Indians that left the field. The players suffered their worst defeat in the last 10 years. And any team which can beat the Carlisle aggregation by such a margin must be a strong 11. A victory over Syracuse on Thanksgiving will mean a successful season for the Hoosiers, end quote. Now, something you got to know is before the Notre Dame football team formally adopted the Fighting Irish moniker, they were actually very commonly called the Hoosiers in the press. But a bunch of Notre Damers found the end zone that day. But it was Joe Pliska who was the only player to hit pay dirt multiple times for Notre Dame. This included a 60-yard scamper, which was considered one of the game's many highlights. But Pliska is also noteworthy because he suited up with the 1920 Hammond Pros from Hammond, Indiana, which, not for nothing, is where a Christmas story takes place. But they were in the National Football League, and he was in with the team on 1920 and 1921. And uh, 1920 marked the first year the modern NFL, in a sense, was in existence. But at any rate, the 1914 drubbing of Carlisle was the only time the two schools met. Believe it or not, just four years later, the school closed in 1918. A much more robust matchup in terms of volume in Notre Dame history was with the Haskell Institute, which is now known as the Haskell Indian Nations University. Like Carlisle, Haskell was a boarding school for natives and was founded in the year 1884, and according to the school's website, during the first year, the school had, quote, 22 elementary school-aged students, and the boys were taught skills in tailoring, wagon making, blacksmithing, harness making, painting, shoe making, and farming, reflecting trades common to their mostly rural and small town environments of reservations. Girls were actually admitted, too, and they studied cooking, sewing, and homemaking. As was typical of many r such rural schools, most of the students' food was produced on the associated Haskell Farm. Older students were expected to work while at the school. End quote. Now, we've talked quite a bit at this point about the native schools, but what was the state of affairs at Notre Dame in and around 1914? Thought you'd never ask. At this point, the school had about 1,100 students. Just for some context, it hovers around the 15,000 mark today if you were to count undergrad and graduate students. And we are still at the point where there is a school-aged, so an elementary school essentially, minimum department on campus. 
football had truly overtaken baseball as the most popular sport on campus for the first time. Even though its popularity was truly surging, it is of note that rule number 11 in the annual catalog that Notre Dame issued each year said as follows, quote, Undue attention to athletics at the expense of study will not be permitted, but students are expected to take part in outdoor sports, end quote. So go outside, have fun, but not too much fun, they reminded you. But the school that, but if you were to ask me, the school is at kind of an interesting point in time during this decade in particular. And that's because they were beginning to move further and further away from the school's early leaders, such as fathers Edward Soren and William Corby, both of whom had passed away in the 1890s. Of course, these guys were visionary leaders in many respects, and one of the things that isn't often talked about, or written about for that matter, is that next wave of campus leaders who kind of grabbed the torch, or was past the baton, whatever whatever cliche you're looking for. So let me get in the weeds a little bit, and this is going to sound a little bit tangential, but Father Andrew Morrissey was the president of the college from 1893 through 1905. And according to fantastic Notre Dame academic historian Father Philip Moore, Father Morrissey, quote, brought on in retrospect what is seen as one of the major crises in the history of Notre Dame, a truly serious academic crisis. Admittedly a man of many good qualities, he was nevertheless deficient in his own education and had neither appreciation of nor interest in scholarship and the intellectual life. This is how you really nicely take someone down, by the way. But anyways, continue the quote here. He was a practical man, but like so many other practical men, he feared action where any financial risk was involved. He thought Notre Dame's financial security was and would remain in the preparatory school, end quote. Father Morrissey was actually on record saying that the university couldn't compete with the Eastern schools, with the huge endowments that, quote, our very existence depends on giving Catholic boys a good preparatory foundation, end quote. And he also stated that, quote, what we need here is a compact, tidy little boarding school. We can't compete with those other institutions that have all the money, end quote. So I mentioned the minimum department earlier, but for quite some time, actually into the 1920s, there was a prep school on Notre Dame's campus. So high school students. And conceivably, you could enter Notre Dame as an elementary school student and stay there through your college years. But Father Morrissey had a quite an emphasis. He put quite an emphasis, I should say, on those high school kids. Uh, thinking of the university more as a boarding school and a college second. So during this time, though, the university was considered stagnant. But slowly, over the decades, the university became much more college-minded and far less prep school-minded. In fact, as I just mentioned, the high school department was abolished on campus in 1924, so they hit that point of no return. But okay, back to the story here. Two weeks before the Notre Dame lads had laid a beating on Carlisle, they also played Haskell for the first time, so 1914. Jess Harper's coach and Knut Rockney's the assistant coach, and they play not one but two Native American schools in the exact same season. So they actually played Haskell for the first time on October 31st, 1914. Halloween, 1914. And that game was played in South Bend at Cartier Field. And it was a 21-7 victory for the Irish. Now, some folks like Cartier Field where? Well, there's a whole episode on the history of Cartier Field in our show's catalog. But if you're ever on Notre Dame's campus, it's really that area right in front of the Hesburgh Library. That was really where the football field was. So people like the Four Horsemen, George Gipp, Knut Rockney, they all played on that area right in front of Touchdown Jesus. But Notre Dame also played Haskell in 1915 and 1916 as well, making it a string of three consecutive seasons in which they squared off. So after the 21-7 victory for the Irish in 1914, they won 34-0 and 26-0, respectively, in 1915 and 1916, again, in favor of the blue and gold. 
By the time these teams squared off again, it was 1921, and head coach Jess Harper had moved on and was actually succeeded in that post by his former assistant, Knut Rockney. And actually, in 1921, this was already Rock's fourth season at the helm. So he felt comfortable enough that his boys would handle Haskell during their November 12th, 1921 game. Again, November, coincidentally, the month that would later become Native American Heritage Month, that, if you can imagine this, Rockney wasn't even at the game. He was actually scouting their next opponent, Marquette, on the road. So the Irish beat Haskell in 1921 without their head coach, 42-7. to Oh, they'd later also beat Marquette. But something that I noticed about the schedule that season, and this is perhaps why Rockney was scouting the next opponent, was that the Haskell game was the third game in eight days for the Irish that year. All three were wins, but get a load of this. They beat Army in New York 28-0 on November 5th, 1921. They stayed in New York and beat Rutgers 48-0 just three days later on November 8th. And four days later, November 12th, they were back home playing Haskell. Three games, eight days. So let's vault now 11 years later. Now it is 1932. And the Irish played Haskell for the fifth and final time. But we've had some pretty big changes here. By this time, Coach Rockney had been killed in a plane crash in March of 1931. And assistant coach Hunk Anderson had taken over the reins. And Hunk was, of course, a good pal of the legendary George Gipp. Now, Hunk's tenure at head coach wasn't hugely successful. He was, by all accounts, a really nice guy, but maybe not the guy to succeed such a legend in Knut Rockney. But boy, his squad absolutely pummeled Haskell, 73 to nothing. And that was Notre Dame's largest margin of victory since they had beaten Beloit, kind of the equivalent of a Division three school even then, 77-0 to in 1926. So in aggregate, the Irish went 5-0 and against Haskell, outscoring the squad by a total of 196-14. to Haskell would eventually retire football in 1938. It was revived a little over a half century later in 1990, but it was retired once again, I think for good it seems, in 2014. So it had about a 25-season run. So we've kind of outlined this, kind of outlined the Native American schools, kind of what Notre Dame was looking at at this time, the recap of all their meetings. You may be wondering, though, why this matters. Well, here it is. Here's where I will shoot my shot, so to speak. Notre Dame playing Native American schools in football was significant for several reasons. First, it symbolized a progressive approach to cultural engagement during a time when Native American communities faced significant challenges. By participating in matchups against schools like Haskell or Carlisle, and even though these schools didn't really give Notre Dame much of a fight, at least on the scoreboard anyway, Notre Dame was contributing to a broader effort of bridging cultural divides and fostering understanding between mainstream American society and these native communities. Again, as I mentioned, while these games may have been considered filler contests, or at least in retrospect in how his history is written and how historiography is considered, they may have been considered filler contests, but they nonetheless contribute greatly to the rich and textured tapestry of the early phases of modern college football history. And this goes for Notre Dame football history as well. And this cannot be downplayed. And as I mentioned earlier, these games provided a platform for cultural exchange. At the time, Native Americans often encountered cultural suppression and limited educational opportunities. The football matchups, as lopsided as they could be, allowed for positive interactions between different cultural groups an increase of visibility for the de facto underdog native institutions, 
as well as challenging stereotypes and, again, fostering a sense of shared humanity. This shared humanity piece is important, lest we forget mainstream American culture and society greatly look down on what? What do we know about this time? They look down on Catholic Irish immigrants as well. That sense of shared humanity, again, it cannot be downplayed. So I mentioned this in the show lead, but the ability and the agency that sports has to bridge cultural differences, well, I meant that. Native Americans have faced innumerable challenges in the last centuries, the past centuries at this point, and still face many of them to this day. But Notre Dame squaring off against these teams promoted positive relationships during a time when such initiatives were especially crucial. So there you go. Shot my shot. And I'll be back with show wrap. All right, I'm back. Hey, hope you enjoyed that. Did you like it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Hey, feel free to let me know. The email address is onward to victory podcast at gmail.com or drop me a Facebook message on the show's Facebook page. It's November. Aside from obviously Native American Heritage Month, which we are talking about now, it is the season of thanks and thanksgiving. I would just like to say really quickly that I'm thankful that you're here listening, and I am thankful for those who have supported the show as the calendar turns to 2024. I know you're going to have a hard time believing this, at least I do. Uh, We will be gearing up for the show's fifth anniversary. And thanks to our pals at WCScreens.com, West Coast Screen Printing and Embroidery, I think we're going to have some really amazing things prepared for you for this upcoming year. So if you'd like to help the show, please share, like, subscribe, leave a review, do whatever it is that you can do, but if you'd like to leave the show a monetary donation. Uh, I always say <laughs> put some coins, uh, plink some coins in the virtual collection baskets. Don't hesitate to go over to paypal.me slash onward to victory or patreon.com slash onward to victory podcast. A side fantastic show sponsors at wcscreens.com. I'd also like to thank those individuals who have contributed significantly in the past or are currently contributing to the show, and they are our consensus All-Americans, and they are Michael Finan of Rutherford, New Jersey, Brad Glazier of Williamsburg, Indiana, Will Fuller of Warren, Ohio, Dr. Jeremy Scarlett of Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, Andy Nickel of South Bend, Indiana, and Mike Johnson from Oak Park, Illinois. I really hope you enjoyed this. We're going to have one more, at least one more episode for uh, 2023. There's going to be some kind of a Christmas-themed episode. I've never done one, (laughs) and that would be something a little different to tackle. So I've been kind of going through the the, uh, school's archives trying to find a compelling topic to kind of wrap our heads around for a holiday Christmas-themed episode. So be on the lookout for that. I think I can probably pull something off. But beyond this, 2024, lots of plans. So as always, make sure you're liking, subscribing, following, whatever it is. That way you're privy to all of the show updates again can't thank you enough for being here it uh it warms my heart every time i get to this point of the recording because you know i'm about to sign off and do some editing and get ready to promote it and send it out to the masses but it's uh always nice it's always nice to know that uh i've been wrapped with such support now for almost five years of onward to victory and with that i will sign off this has been onward to victory a notre dame football podcast And in kindness, I am your host, Alex Painter. And as always, friends, go Irish.